Hi, I'm James Gurney, and welcome to History Infection number six. This time we're looking at a personal story, two bacteria, and some good history. A 26-year-old man wakes up feeling fine and fantastic. He decides to have a rather large English breakfast meal. This is something he's going to regret later on. At around about 11.30, he feels a sharp pain in his abdomen. He puts this down to just being digestion from having a bit too much for breakfast. However, around 1pm, he begins to vomit and have bowel movements. This continues until 4pm, when he begins to notice the pain has increased quite a bit and become more of a stabbing and pulsating pain. Around 4.30pm, he notices that there's actually this blood in his bowel movements. He has some isotonic drink, which he regurgitates almost immediately and begins convulsing of his muscles down his side, and then vomits quite violently and has about 150 mils of bright pink blood in his vomit. At this point, an ambulance was called, and he was taken to a local hospital and admitted and given antiemetics and painkillers and two litres of IV fluids. He was seen by a consultant doctor who believed the patient was suffering from a bacterial infection known as Campylobacter. He was given more IV fluids and admitted overnight. The patient decided to discharge himself the next day as he had to catch a train back up to Nottingham. He rested for the following five days with fluids at home and feeling quite bad for himself. So that's how I spent my Christmas holiday uh, inside a hospital with a bacterial infection, essentially having dysentery it seems. Um, Campylobacter, however, is actually quite a common bacteria. It's not particularly common infection in the UK and the US. It's more common worldwide, but there's different strains worldwide. But it's a very common bacteria. It's often found inside birds, such as you know chickens and pigeons. It colonizes their gastric and intestinal tracts. Undercooked chicken is a very common way to actually get the bacteria. However, I can't for the life of me think of having any chicken for the two to three weeks before that point, apart from the day before, which is a bit too quick to get the infection. Campylobacter is also the leading cause of a neurological condition known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is where your body becomes a bit confused and decides to start attacking itself. This happens because the bacteria have a very clever system of mimicking your cell surface structure. So they put these little bits of protein outside themselves and say, hey, I'm actually, it's okay, I'm not a bacteria, I'm actually a nerve cell. But sometimes your body sees through this trick and goes, actually, no, you're not, you're not one of me, you're a bacteria. So it decides to start attacking this, but then it gets out of control because it thinks all your nerve cells are actually bacteria as well. This leads to Guillain-Barre, which is essentially uh, ascending paralysis from your extremities to your trunk. Of course, paralysis around your lungs can be a bit of an issue if you like breathing. Fortunately, though, it seems I've missed out on this wonderful neurological condition and am completely fine now. Whenever I think of Campylobacter, I always think of Helicobacter for maybe three or four different reasons. One being that in the lab next to me, they work on both Campylobacter and Helicobacter. And whenever I read a textbook, it always said Campylobacter and Helicobacter next to each other. And Campylobacter, it seems, used to be the name for Helicobacter. But what is Helicobacter? Well, Helicobacter was a bacteria that was only discovered in 1982, it seems. Until very recently, everyone thought that stomach ulcers, peptic and gastric ulcers, were caused by stress or bad diet. But actually, it turns out that most ulcers seem to be caused by bacteria, a bacteria known as Helicobacter pylori. Or as my friend Nimit calls it, Helicobacter. Two physicians by the name of Warren and Marshall decided that conventional wisdom was wrong. They thought that ulcers were caused by an infection. As far back as 1875, some doctors and biologists had suggested that they could isolate bacteria from uh, the stomach. However, it's very difficult to isolate and grow this bacteria in a culture dish. You need quite specific conditions. People thought for a long time that pH was too low in the stomach to allow anything to grow. The pH is equivalent to a car battery. So it wasn't until Marsh and Warren were actually able to reliably culture a bacteria from stomach biopsies of people with ulcers that they were able to show that, in fact, a bacteria was colonizing the stomach and the rest of the biological community had to accept that, in fact, the stomach was colonized just the same way as everything else in our body, it seems. Helicobacter got its name change in 1989 when RNA-S16 sequencing showed that it actually wasn't all that closely related to Campylobacter and it was given a completely new name of its own with no other group, Helicobacter. 
So here's where the story gets interesting. Conventional wisdom is a horrible thing, and it takes a lot to overturn what the establishment thinks of a certain principle. In this case, this principle was that spicy foods and bad diet and stress caused ulcers. Some had suggested that Helicobacter was actually just a bystander, that the ulcer allowed the bacteria to actually infect the site and colonise the stomach, but unless the person had an ulcer, they wouldn't get Helicobacter. Marshall got a bit tired of dealing with this constant criticism of his ideas, so he decided to prove himself right with a great self-experiment, very similar to what Pettenkoffer did. He decided to drink a vial of Helicobacter and see what happens. Unlike Pettenkoffer, though, he wasn't fine. He got quite ill and started vomiting quite a bit. Ten days later, when they endoscoped him, they showed that, in fact, he had developed an ulcer and the Helicobacter was there causing the ulcer. He's quite often asked what the vial tasted like, but apparently he was too wrapped up in the moment he doesn't remember tasting it. Warren and Marshall went in to show that antibiotics were actually a successful and useful treatment of ulcers, and in 1994, the NIH decided to change its protocol and suggest that ulcers were treated with antibiotics first. However, Marshall has also stated that a number of doctors still don't believe that their patients' ulcers are caused by bacterial infections. They still maintain, well... Some ulcers might be caused by bacteria, but yours is caused by stress, or yours is caused by your bad diet. In 2005, Marshall Warren's ideas were vindicated by them winning the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. You've got to remember that ulcers are actually quite a high cause of death in a number of people worldwide. Here's a graph showing just that. A thing we still don't fully understand is why and how Helicobacter will lead to causing an ulcer. Only 15% of people who Show, are shown to be positive for having the bacteria in the stomach will actually develop an ulcer. So there's quite a lot of room there to understand how the bacteria becomes pathogenic. But that's a story for another time when someone's worked it out. So I hope you enjoyed the somewhat sordid version of a history of infection, and I haven't offended you too much by talking about my bowel movements. Um, next time I'll be looking at Yersinius pestis, the probable cause of agent of the plague. This is probably going to be a two-parter because the story stretches back to you know the Middle Ages up until early 19th century. So there's a lot to cover and a lot of interesting people and a lot of interesting things happened. So thanks for watching. Uh, feel free to like and share and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, leave them below and I'll try to get back to you. See you next time.